On this edition of Independent Sources, The Great Rent Debate, the future of affordable living in New York hangs in the balance as state legislators negotiate. We could have unscrupulous landlords who began to harass tenants, began to say, you know, there's no protection, began to try to get them out of that housing. And just beat it, an all-woman group that's breaking new ground by marching to the beat of its own drums. It's a political statement in the sense that uh, it's Afro-Brazilian music that's, like I said, traditionally so male. When you go to Brazil, it's all the guys playing it all the time. So we're going to take it here, and, and we want to spread this culture, and we want to spread this music. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The future of affordable renting in the city hangs in the balance as state legislators continue to debate over whether rent stabilization laws should be renewed. Mayor Bill de Blasio's recent renewal of the city's laws was supposed to signal to Albany that there was a true commitment to provide New Yorkers with more affordable living at a time when rents are skyrocketing. So far, state legislators don't seem to be listening. I spoke to Judge okay, Betty Staten, the president um, of Legal Services New York City, about the disparity between the what the state and city rent, seem to want the and the future of affordable housing in New York. Control. Judge uh, Betty Staten, the rent stabilization laws may expire soon because of the legislature's inaction. Now, if that were to happen, how many people will this impact? Yes, well, it would impact the two million people who are covered by rent regulations at this time in New York City. Um, but actually, in terms of the effect on those folks, nothing should really happen. Mm -hmm. uh, those rent-regulated people, uh, tenants, have leases. And until those leases expire, even if there's no rent regulations, those contracts leases remain in effect. So all of the rights that they have under those leases remain in effect. And even those who, who uh, tenants whose leases might have expired, well, the landlord was to send them renewal, and those, those people are protected. Uh, what could happen is what we're concerned about. Okay. And what could happen is that uh, if tenants don't know their rights, if they don't know that their leases continue, if they don't know the procedure that the landlord must go, even if they're not a rent-regulated tenant, that is to go to court before they have to move, we could have unscrupulous landlords who began to harass tenants, began to say, you know, there's no protection, began to try to get them out of that housing. And uh, even um, I read a, a release, a press release from the, May, from the governor who warned them, don't do that. Even if the rent regulations uh, currently expire tonight, uh, it has happened in the past, mm -hmm. but it's only for a short period of time. Okay. We pr pretty much feel certain that they will eventually being. Why are they pushing, taking this to the 11th hour? You're asking me a question that I cannot <laughs> answer. You're asking me a question that, you know, I guess everyone in the city is asking why. Why does anything take so long? Um, they have been working on it, but I don't know how, how much. I, I only know the effect of what it would have on those thousands of tenants that we represent at Legal Services. Mm -hmm. And um, as I indicated, for the short term, there should be no effect because mm -hmm. they have leases. Uh, rent regulated tenants must have leases. Mm -hmm. uh, and those leases are still in effect. They're mm -hmm. like a contract. If you have sure. a contract, you can't just break it in the middle of the contract. You know, uh, politics play a role in everything. Uh, but the interesting part for me is the, the mayor usually takes the blame for these issues where the, when it's the governor who has all the power and makes all the decision. Uh, why do you think the, the governor is not acting f more forcefully? I have no idea politically what's going on. Essentially, we concentrate on representing our sure, clients. Sure. And representing our clients meaning means that we are looking at 
what will happen, the harassment that might happen to our clients, uh, the deception that might happen to our clients when the landlords come in and try to use uh, short-term uh, expiration to their advantage and to the disadvantage of the many tenants. We, we're having that problem all over the city. Sure. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, and it's a, a special problem uh, in Brooklyn where uh, landlords are doing all kinds of things that affect negatively the, the, the tenants that we represent, and that is what we're concerned about. Such as? Such as going into an apartment and saying that we're going to fix it, but end up trashing and t totally destroying that apartment, and that was so egregious that even those landlords were arrested. Mm -hmm. Going into tenants' houses and and and, and finding ways to displace them because once a, t a rent regulated tenant moves out of an apartment there is an automatic 20 percent increase in that apartment's rent and they do that and they also go in and they do some sort of improvement that they claim to be major improvement or improvement in individual apartments and then they attach on another percentage to um, the rent that's charged and that doesn't end mm -hmm. when when the improvement is paid for it goes on forever and then the landlords are in, you know they use the fact that if they keep moving out tenants moving tenants in getting a 20 percent or whatever and they reach the twenty five hundred dollar rent the apartment is automatically decontrolled. Are we talking about largely low income or across the board? Uh, We're talking about rent regulated tenants and rent regulated tenants what is that class uh, of tenants where there is some protection, there is some way to keep an apartment reasonable? Recently, I looked at some st statistics that say the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment is over $3,000. Where? In the city? Uh, generally, in the okay. city, generally. But locally in Brooklyn, Manhattan, I think the, the, the highest was in Manhattan someplace. But at the same time, even affordable houses are not affordable for, for the, the tenants that we represent mm -hmm. because, for instance, eight-person household, household. Okay. the maximum that we can represent them because our services are free is 40000 a year. That's mm -hmm. for eight-family household. Oh. So you can imagine what kind of rent they can pay. Sure. And then it's... Don't talk about a two-family for $15,000 or a three-family, a three-person family at, at $20,000. So when we talk about affordable, you know, unfortunately, uh, we're not talking about people low income. Sure. But, but the rent regulations have benefited in a way that middle income and people with limited income sure. can afford to remain in the city. And what's happening is... We're not we're not keeping those folks in in our cities anymore. In our particular New York City, in Brooklyn, okay. and and other parts of the of this of the city. Sure. I want to uh, change the conversation to the tenant protection unit. The, yes. the government the governor is, is really high on that uh, agency and thinks it's doing a wonderful job. How effective has it been? What we have been witnesses is deception. And scrupulous beha unscrupulous behavior, all kinds of things on the behavior of people. Mm -hmm. um, the agency cannot totally control people. Now, they may have mechanism where they might bring actions, contempt, fines, but landlords essentially think of that as the cost of doing business. And some of them continue to harass and 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 push out tenants and do all kinds of things so we're constantly working against um, people who make their own decisions on the basis of greed so yes they have the the mechanism and the authority it doesn't always work perfectly because you're still working against those people who make decisions and oh well I'm going to be fine X number of dollars and I can raise a rent or I can do this and now with them pushing uh, the tenants out of the rent regulated and bringing in I mean we have that going on all the time they will push tenants out of rent stabilized buildings by all kinds of means those means may mean that they'll come in and say things like I had one rent stabilized tenant who said the landlord 
The, uh, my building was sold. There's a new landlord, and he said I have to move. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to move, but she doesn't know that. Right. And so we have to educate them and say, I'm telling you, you don't have to move. You never know a tenant does not ever have to move until a law says so, until a court says so. Don't go anyplace. Don't believe what the tenant says. I mean, the landlord said, do not believe it. Call up somebody. Find out what your rights are because they are lying. Justin, so who can tenants call if they have problems with their landlords? Well, specifically related to the rent, uh, t uh, the rent regulations termination now, if they have issues, immediate issues, they can call 311 and tell them that they have an issue because of the uh, termination or the expiration of the rent regulation. Mm -hmm. They could also call the public advocate. She said that if you have an issue, call, call my office, and that office is 212-669-7250. Uh, they can also call the uh, New York City Controller's Office. He has a um, community action center, and he's invited people to call his number, and that number is 212-669-3916. And generally speaking, that 311 will connect them with legal services. Okay for all kinds of issues beyond the expiration of the rent regulations. And I will say one other thing about the rent regulation, even if it expires, we expect it to be uh, renewed and it would be retroactive. So it okay. will cover any period of expiration. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Still to come on the show, examining the foster care system to film. Before that, Abby Shola and Sarah Pizon have some other news. Thanks, Gary. Every week we ask you to tell us what's trending in your community. Here's what we gathered. Sarah, what's happening? There's growing racial tension in El Barrio. The recent posting of dozens of signs along First Avenue between 115th and 125th Street containing blunt, discriminatory messages against the newer white residents is upsetting the community. Neighbors say the main problem with the new residents in the area is that they are contributing to rent hikes. Well, what do the signs actually say? So the signs read, and I quote, white people and gentrifying people of color, please do us a favor and get out of Harlem. Wow. So how are the residents reacting to this? So obviously the targeted community feels extremely uncomfortable with these signs. You know, they feel like their skin color should not determine where they should live. And the people that have been there forever say that actually this reveals a valid need for self-defense against what they call the colonization of a historically Hispanic neighborhood. Wow. Is there anything being done to solve the problem? Not at the moment. Thankfully, no um, complaints or attacks have been reported. And um, Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito's office did issue a statement saying that they are working to um, keep El Barrio's character and affordability. Wow. I would be interested to see how they'll keep the affordability in that area. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that story. We'll keep an eye out on it. How well do you know New York City bike laws? DNAinfo.com recently posed that question to New Yorkers on their website. The online news outlet created a quiz to test how much its readers really know about city bike laws in light of the fact that there are over 200,000 people riding bikes in the city every day. Wow, so what kind of questions are on the test? Questions like, if you run a red light, can you get a fine? Or can you ride on the wrong side of the street? When I took the test, I scored 50%. <laughs> but guess what? The majority of people that took the test scored 0 to 49%. So I didn't do half bad. Well, wow, some people really don't know the bike laws. No, they don't, and it could get very expensive. Because, for example, you can get a $100 fine if you're riding a bike on a non-permitted sidewalk. Wow. So people should be careful. Ouch, yeah. Yeah. Here's a cool international exchange program happening later this summer. A Goannas-based nonprofit is partnering with a French organization to send five students from Brooklyn and New Jersey to Paris to create a short movie with their Parisian counterparts. Well, lucky them. I How know. did the project come about? So uh, Real Works is a Brooklyn nonprofit that provides a free milk filmmaking program to at-risk youth. And they've partnered with A Thousand Visages, which is a French organization that has a similar mission. And um, they've selected five students who are going to go abroad and make a film together. Wow. So what kind of themes are they focusing on for the film? So um, the themes for the two teams will include roadblocks to their dreams, race in the film industry, and the underrepresentation of minorities, both in France and in the United States. Wow. 
That sounds like a wonderful idea. Wish them luck. Absolutely, yeah. A man who served over 17 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit now has a fresh take on life in the form of a juice bar. Eric Gleason recently opened the Fresh Take Juice Bar on Westchester Avenue in the East Bronx after he noticed there were no healthy food options in the area. Wow, what a great thing to do. So what happened with this case? Well, basically, when he was 19 years old in 1995, he was arrested and charged for the murder of a livery cab driver. Ooh. Yeah. Two years later, he was sentenced to 25 years to life. Wow. So while in prison, he started researching his case, and then he found out that it was actually gang-related. So he wrote to the U.S. Attorney's Office, mm -hmm. and then the Bronx District Attorney's Office reinvestigated the case. So eventually, he was exonerated and released. Wow. Yes. So now his next challenge is, is to run a juice bar? Yeah, and interestingly, he's never juiced before opening his juice bar. Mm -hmm. um, but he felt that in the neighborhood, like I said before, there were no healthy food options. Mm -hmm. And now that he has this fresh take on life, he decided to name it Fresh Take Juice. His goal is to have his juice in grocery stores. Wow, that's great. Well, we wish him luck. Absolutely. That's it for this week. Be sure to tweet us at Indie Sources, hashtag Abby and Sarah. And tell us what's buzzing in your community. Thanks for staying tuned. This week, our film focus segment zooms in on the independent production Know How. Hey, we're from the Administration for Children's Services. Just come here and take children from their parents? How would you like that somebody took your kid? The film centers on five youths whose lives intertwine through loss and heartbreak. The movie draws from its stars' experiences who have been in the foster care system. The film's director, Juan Carlos Pinedo Escoriaza, was also once in foster care himself. He spoke to Abby Ishola via Skype, along with the film's producer, Paul Griffin, who was in our studio. Juan Carlos, thanks for being on the show. Paul, thank you for joining us as well. Thanks, Abby. So, Juan Carlos, your film Know How, it's the story of several foster kids and um, basically growing up in the foster care system. How did the idea of that come about? Oh, yeah. So the idea for Know How really stems from a nonprofit called The Possibility Project, which is based in New York City. And what they do is they bring a group of foster care youth together every single year to write and then perform in an off-Broadway play about their own lives. And they use it uh, to really be a catharsis and a way for them to overcome the negative forces in their lives. Uh, right around, I want to say, May 2010, I started chatting with Paul, uh, the founder of the project, and we started talking about what a film like this would be. And so I really was introduced to the project actually maybe about a decade or so before when it was down in D.C. and was for at-risk youth, and then it made its way up to New York. Uh, I was actually at possibly the second, third show that they ever put on back wow. when I was in high school. So it was really just sort of this kind of fate of coming back full circle and then finding uh, the project again many, many years later. And you're the founder and president of the Possibility Project, yeah. correct? Yes. I run the nonprofit here in, in New York City. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about your work? I know that um, Juan Carlos talked briefly about it. Yeah, sure. So we bring together uh, groups of teenagers from all over the city, as diverse as possible. No one is chosen on the basis of talent. And uh, they go through a 10-month creative process where um, they learn to build relationships across difference, resolve the very uh, serious conflicts they face, engage in community action, and learn leadership. And the goal is really about transformation. Uh, it's about changing their lives and then engaging them in changing their communities. And the way they do that is they work together to write an original musical from the stories of their lives, uh, focused both on the most serious issues they face and their ideas for change, which they perform on Broadway. Um, mm -hmm. About 99% of our young people graduate from high school and get their GED, and about 90% go on to college. So it has a huge impact on their lives. And uh, we have three programs here with 140 teenagers every year. One of them is for young people in foster care. And uh, this year we're actually starting a fourth program for young people who are um, in the probation system, uh, court-involved youth. Wow. So Juan Carlos, how was it working with actors who actually were in the foster care system mm -hmm. as a director? Mm -hmm. It was actually incredible. So from the very start, and I come from a documentary background, it was really just a meeting and collaboration between the youth themselves and I to work on the script, talk about those emotional moments. I mean, literally the first time we sat down uh, was in October of 2010. And we just sat around in a circle and we just started talking about these stories, about what they meant, where they came from, 
uh, the foster care system as a whole. And so we started to just become great friends. And honestly, they're some of my best friends today. Wow, I look yeah. on the website for Know How and it seems more like a movement. How are you guys using the film to spread awareness about foster care and people who grow up in foster care, I should say? Well, I think so. I'll, I'll start and I'll let Paul kind of chime in because <laughs> we both have a lot <laughs> yes. to say. Uh, but essentially, I think the biggest piece of it is that it's youth led. So mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest questions that we have today that we're struggling with in terms of creating and affecting real systemic change is that it's coming from a place that's untrue. Not that everyone doesn't have the best intentions at heart, but that from from the theoretical standpoint, the best way to change something is for it to be led by the people who are going through it. And so this movement, this change in the way to perceive change at all, uh, really stems from the idea that what if the answer to foster care is foster care youth, you know, mm. and former foster care youth, people who have been through the system, who understand the nuances in a way that nobody else can, that can then say, this is what we want to change. This is how we perceive the differences in, in the system and how those nuanced ways of, that <clears throat> we're not privy to could really effectively change and be better. Hmm. Uh, and so I think from a very bottom level, it's that. Uh, from a larger level, it's to say that, yes, we are starting a movement. The movement is one that we're, are, we're a part of. You know, There's a lot of nonprofits yeah. in this system already. Yeah. They're advocating. They're doing great things. And what we want to do is help elevate a lot of those smart and strategic ways in which they're working to help broaden the landscape and to really bring it into the mainstream. Okay. And Paul, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just think it's important to know. I mean, foster care has never worked, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if the measure of success is the outcomes for them as adults. And so we're not talking about taking something that worked and getting it back to that. We're talking about creating a new vision for, uh, for how foster care can work in that way. And as Juan Carlos just mentioned, it really has to start with the young people and those who've uh, gone through it. And so uh, we have an online social action campaign in partnership with TakePark.com. It's part of Participant Media that shows sort of simple steps, sort of simple tiered actions for those people who want to get involved and get engaged. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then we've partnered with a lot of other organizations to provide resources. The Dave Thomas Foundation, California Youth Connect, Youth Communications, both local and national uh, nonprofits. And then uh, on top of that, we've also taken the film down here locally in New York City to the Administration of Children's Services. And we have uh, screened it for 250 of their executive leadership, all of the attorneys who work there. And we're going to continue that process. Wow. And what we're really after is for them to listen to what young people have to say, uh, mm -hmm. to engage in conversation, and then long term start to find ways to include young people inside the organization around their decision making and planning so that when they, uh, when they are doing things, they're informed. Mm -hmm. right? One of the surprising things about this film uh, when we've screened it for foster care audiences is that a lot of the people who work with them were surprised by the stories. Wow. They just simply were unaware and are unaware of what it's like for the young people going through the system. And the film's been invaluable in terms of communicating that. Wow, it sounds like an awesome project. Thank That's you. Paul and Juan Carlos, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Thank Abby. you, really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. No problem. The film is currently available on Netflix, iTunes, and other digital platforms. When we come back, a group of women find camaraderie and empowerment in music. Finally from us, Batala New York City is an all-woman drum group that plays a fusion of samba and reggae music. The group is one of the growing numbers of all ladies bands who are beating down gender stereotypes. Judith Escalona tells us more. Stacey Kovacs is hitting the streets of New York with an energetic all-woman drumming band called Batala New York City. The band plays a fusion of samba and reggae. Batala literally means hit there in French and in Brazilian Portuguese slang. It all started in 1997 in a Paris park where Giba Gonçalves from Bahia, Brazil would meet with friends to play music just for fun. 
More people joined in and a samba reggae band was formed. It later spread to other cities in Europe, the U.S. and Argentina. They branded themselves Batala and have become a kind of international franchise with Gonsalves as director. The total number of bands right now is hovering around 30 around the world and he's the head maestro of all of them and uh, we're all very connected on social media and we all play the same music and we use the same hand signs and we wear the same stuff and the same logos with our various cities. Uh, and so in, in the project itself, there's about 1,600 drummers. Kovacs heard Batala's distinct musical style and decided to create a band for New York. She wanted it to be an all-woman group, like Batala Washington, D.C., partly to make a political statement. I felt that this was something important to do, especially in New York City, because number one, it doesn't exist here. Number two, it's, 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 a, it's a political statement in the sense that uh, it's Afro-Brazilian music that's, like I said, traditionally so male. When you go to Brazil, it's all the guys playing it all the time. So we're going to take it here, and, and we want to spread this culture, and we want to spread this music, because the music's, the music's amazing music. And, and the reason I also, the other reason I wanted to be all female is because I knew in my heart it would succeed in New York City as an all-women's group because it's powerful, it's choreographed, it's flashy, it's colorful, it's loud as hell. There were naysayers. I was involved in a lot of Brazilian music drum groups before I started this one, and the response from those people uh, were, oh, don't ever succeed. You know, you can't have an all-women's group. You won't find enough people. Uh, you won't find enough women. That was three years ago. Right now, Batala New York City has a roster of 82 women who volunteer their time to play one of four different kinds of drums. Sarah Valentine is a freelance events planner. She's been with Batala New York City since it began in 2012. In 1992, I went to the Republican National Convention in Houston, Texas, and I saw the WAC Drum Corps play, the Women's Action Coalition, and I knew WAC as an activist group in New York City fighting for women's rights and reproductive health, um, along with a group called WAM. But I did not know that they had a drum corps. So when I saw this, it was just like, the earth shook for me. It was very exciting to see these women of all ages playing drums together. For Valentine, Batala New York City was perfect in many other ways. It's a very accepting group, forgiving group. If you make mistakes, the music is a little forgiving. It's incredible. It's creative, it's magical, it transforms people. The fact that this, this organization is worldwide, so I know that I'm kind of part of a fraternity now where I can go you know, across the U.S. to South America and across Europe with this group and play the same music and we share commonalities and I think that that's fantastic. Batala New York City recently returned from Bahia where they already seem to be changing the minds of a few naysayers. Right now the reaction is positive and we're growing and we're getting a lot more press and you know we have a lot more social media presence and because we're in New York City there is a lot of pressure from the global project for us to be the biggest, the best. Kovacs' plans for the future of Batala New York City are just that, to be the biggest and the best. I want 150 women. I want to play as many shows as possible, as many parades. I want to tour the country. I have this sort of plan in my head, which I don't know how possible it is to have a, a teen and a child version you know, like after school type stuff. Out of the 30 Batala bands that exist worldwide, four are all women. Batala New York City, Batala Washington DC, Batala Brasilia, and Batala Mendoza Argentina. Stacy Kovacs plans to add several more to that roster. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.